So look, we all know every YouTube filmmaker is gonna be telling you one thing. You gotta buy this, you gotta buy that, you gotta buy this. But if you're a low budget filmmaker, I'm gonna tell you, you need to invest wisely and you need to not be spending your money unnecessarily. So this video is going to be my best advice from 20 years of scrappy independent filmmaking about where to actually spend your money, where to save your money, and why. The biggest mistake that most people do is to blow their entire budget just on the camera. And I'm gonna tell you, please do not do that. Unless you're gonna be a DP and making money off of that camera, then you definitely don't need like a RED or an Ari camera. Just get something that's gonna get you going and get you started, whatever that budget may be. But you need to be saving money for all the other things you're gonna be talking about in this video. The truth is that even for freelance shooters, you don't need a cinema camera to be making money off of your camera. My freelance shooting rate for the last job I did for this, you know, TikTok thing for this big company was a thousand dollars a day. And I just showed up with my iPhone and my tripod and a couple little accessories and that was it. And other jobs have just brought my Panasonic G9 and a couple of lenses and accessories, etc. And I'm also charging a thousand dollars a day, but then tacking on like a $300 kit fee for all the gear that I'm bringing. So if you do get hired to shoot something, then you're gonna make all the money you spent on this investment back very quickly. But the problem with investing in cameras in general is that this is a depreciating asset. Basically, every day I own this thing is becoming less and less valuable because the technology and cameras just improve so quickly. It just doesn't make a lot of sense for most of us to be spending all of our money on camera gear. I say get something that'll get the job done and call it a day. And if you have a specific project that needs a more cinematic, big budget look, then bring on a DP that has the camera you want. You know, rent out that camera. If it's not gonna be making you money, then don't purchase it. For my purposes, I love my Panasonic G9. It really gets the job done. It's got excellent built-in stabilization. These cameras are small. You get cheaper glass, cheaper lenses with a micro four thirds camera than you would with like a full frame camera. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people in the comments saying, you know, micro four thirds camera, why would you want that? The truth of the matter is you really shouldn't be overthinking your camera choice anyways if you're beginning your filmmaking journey. Your camera is really just one tool that you're going to be using to tell your stories and that is what you need to be focusing on. Your stories, your writing, those are the things that are going to completely make or break every project that you do. You're gonna need batteries and you're gonna need more than you think. I recommend getting 50% more battery power than you think you're gonna need for any given shoot day because a lot of times you will just burn through that stuff. You'll have a long day and you do not wanna run out of power when you're on set. I also recommend investing in aftermarket battery chargers, especially for camera batteries, because a lot of the times the one that they give you with your camera is only gonna be able to charge one battery at a time, and that's just not that useful, way too slow. You're gonna want something that can charge at least two batteries at the same time. Damn straight, I always wanted to do that, man don't spend all of your money on lenses either because lenses are just really easily rented from places like lensrentals.com, for example, or borrowlenses.com. They'll just mail you a box with the lens that you want and it's pretty reasonably priced. So depending on what project you're working on, if you need specific lenses, they're really easy to come by. There's obviously also local rental houses, but you should have some lenses on hand. And I think that the best move is to get just a workhorse zoom lens, especially if you're working with like a DSLR. My main lens, which is on this camera I'm recording with right now, is a Lumix F2.8 12 to 35 millimeter zoom, which gives you the equivalent of 24 to 70 millimeters. And that's really all I need for 75% of stuff that I do. The important thing is a workhorse zoom lens or two will will carry you much further in the beginning of your filmmaking career than trying to start individually investing in prime lenses. They're gonna be less convenient, a lot more expensive to acquire a whole set, and it's just gonna slow you down. So workhorse zoom, call it a day. The beautiful part about audio gear is that it holds its value incredibly well. For example, I've had this shotgun mic for maybe 10 years, and if I go sell it on Craigslist right now, I'm gonna get the exact same price that I paid for it when I bought it on Craigslist 10 years ago. My sound recorder that I'm using to record this video, I bought that brand new on Amazon seven years ago for 300 bucks. If you go on Amazon right now, it costs 300 bucks brand new. So if it helps you, you know, you're really not even spending the money on this gear if you buy wisely, especially if you buy secondhand, you're just putting the money away for a while. You know, I can sell this recorder, I can sell this microphone if I need, and I can get back the money that I put into it. But in the meantime, I'm gonna be setting myself up for success to get great audio in my projects, which is the number one thing that amateur filmmakers mess up and it's completely unforgivable. You're much better off getting bad visuals than bad audio in a novice film. There's a good chance that I'll have this tripod for the rest of my life.
I absolutely love it, and it's built to last, and I treat it like a baby. This tripod was not cheap by any means. In fact, when I got it, it was probably like the most valuable piece of kit I even owned, but I'm so glad that I invested my money here, because even though it costs money to get a good tripod, it costs money to own a cheap, crappy tripod. And let me tell you, if you've ever shot a short film or anything where you have your whole camera kit on a tripod that you don't trust, you know it is the most anxiety inducing day of your life. I shot a short film Hawaii where I had basically this whole rig plus you know a big monitor on here on this crappy Amazon tripod I got and I did not trust that tripod at all and every time I turned around it would start tipping over. It was a nightmare and that costs you not only the quality of your film because you're distracted, you can't leave your tripod for a second without worrying about it, but it can potentially cost you your entire camera setup. And real quick, the last thing about a great set of tripods in the reason I love this one, this Flowtech leg system, is you can just open these levers and they will go the full length. You don't have to like twist three different knobs to get the tripod to full extension. Now, if you saw my video from a couple weeks ago about how to get cinematic lighting on a budget, I kind of walked through all of the lighting and grip gear I own, which is all very low budget kind of crappy stuff. What I started with back in the day was Home Depot construction lights. And I just kind of graduated from there to these no brand name fluorescent soft boxes. I actually shot a feature film with those. And I hadn't gone much further since then, but LED technology and lighting has come a long way. You can get one of those Aperture MC type lights. I have an off brand one that I showed in my cinematic lighting video. The RC120B light is a pretty powerful and versatile LED C OB lights. And if you get one more powerful light like this, then you can really have a lot more options for lighting setups with some small accessory lights. But ideally, you're going to have three lights or two lights and a reflector, and that will give you some options to create some good lighting setups. It's very easy to just upgrade your kit over time. So don't feel like you need to get everything all at once. Start really small, start really cheap, and as your needs grow, you know, slowly add more lighting to your kit. And the cool thing about lighting accessories, you know, grip gear, is that that stuff's very cheap. So if you're getting lighting stands or something, you know, flags, reflectors, all that stuff. Not too expensive, but will hold its value. You know, the exception might be C stands. They're kind of expensive, but they're, you know, the fundamental building block of most lighting setups. And the great thing about a C stand is you're gonna be able to sell that for the same value. They will hold their value incredibly well. If you're going to be editing your own stuff, you're going to need a computer to work off of. And if you've seen my old videos, you know that I've been a professional freelance editor for, I don't know, five, six years now. But here's the thing. You don't need the most powerful computer to even make a living as an editor. You can actually work on a pretty weak system if your workflow is correct. Proxy workflows are your friend. You know, that's where you're taking whatever you're shooting on and transcoding it overnight or whenever. That's gonna allow you to make your edits much more smoothly than if you were working off the raw camera files. So if you're trying to be a professional editor, for example, and maybe you wanna use Apple computers because most client work is done with Apple products, those M1 MacBook Airs, they don't have a lot of ports, but those Mac Thunderbolt ports are incredibly versatile. So you can just get a hub connected to that. You're gonna have all kinds of connectivity. If you're not making money based on how fast your computer is running exports and processing and all that, then just don't blow all of your money on like a $7,000 M1 Max MacBook Pro. You know, you gotta be thinking about what is that extra power, that extra quality going to earn me financially versus what it's going to cost. And better yet, if you're not in an Apple ecosystem already, then just go for a Windows machine. You're gonna get a lot more power for your buck. Better yet, just build your PC yourself. That's what I used to do. It's really the most cost-effective way to get an editing machine set up and you get to learn what all of the parts do along the way. You can also continuously upgrade parts on a PC that you build, so you'll never have to start over with an entirely new computer as it starts going obsolete. All right, let's talk about hard drives for a second. You're gonna need them if you're a filmmaker. And not only are you gonna need one, you're going to need another one for backups and redundancies. All hard drives fail. So any storage you need for your projects, you have to double that cost immediately if you wanna have any measure of safety, which you should. One thing to keep in mind though is that cost differences between hard drives are sometimes very small for massive storage size differences. So just pulling numbers out of the air, say that you saw a 12 terabyte hard drive for 200 bucks and you're thinking, that's all the storage I really need. But 
there might be a 16 terabyte version of that drive for 220 bucks. So for an extra $20, you're getting an extra four terabytes. So if you can plan ahead and get a bigger drive, then go for it. You also have SSDs, which are very handy, a great tool to have, not completely necessary, but you're gonna get so much more speed on an SSD. So if you wanna have an SSD for maybe your operating system and for any active projects that you're working on, you'll be able to work much more smoothly and quickly on that SSD, and then you can move it over to your traditional hard drive once you're done with that project. Obviously the big one for most of us is going to be Adobe Creative Cloud and it is expensive, but you don't need Adobe Creative Cloud. There's other options out there. If you're not doing client work or expecting to make a living as an editor, for example, just use DaVinci Resolve. It's free. Uh, it replaces Premiere and After Effects. It's got world-class coloring software built right into it, and you won't have to pay a dollar. And if you're going with DaVinci, there's plenty of free photo editing programs like GIMP to replace Photoshop, so you don't really need to worry about that. On the other hand, if you'll be making money off your work, then investing in Adobe Creative Cloud is a good idea since it's just much more widely used in professional settings. And if you're trying to save money on that expensive Adobe Cloud subscription, I don't blame you, it is really pricey. What some people do is since they give you two computers to access your Creative Cloud subscription with, two people will split a single account. So, you know, maybe you and a buddy both need Premiere and Photoshop and After Effects, etc. So maybe you can split that subscription cost for an annual plan and make it work that way. And hey, you could also get Avid Media Composer if you're going to be editing on TV shows or films. But if you're like most of us and you're gonna be kind of taking what you can get as an editor and you don't want to specialize in editing maybe, then go with Adobe. Another subscription you should really consider investing in is a stock music subscription. If you're doing multiple videos a month or a year, purchasing individual stock music tracks for those projects is really gonna add up and it's not gonna be cost effective versus doing, say, an annual subscription plan. Me personally, I use Artlist.io. That's what I've been using for years. I've probably used it in about two thirds of the client editing work that I've done. The great thing about Artlist is they just really have an amazing selection of music. It's very professional you know, every genre, every mood you can think of, but they don't sound like stock music tracks. You know, they sound like real songs and that's kind of hard to find out there in all these stock music subscriptions. So yes, it's $200 a year, but that's gonna get you unlimited tracks for unlimited projects. You're gonna be able to use it in everything from monetized YouTube videos to theatrical releases of films to broadcast commercials for your clients. So if you're interested in Artlist, check out the link in my description because you'll get two months for free with it and you'll be helping out this little channel at the same time. So I hope this helped you and I know I didn't go into very many specific products because I really don't want to get into the weeds about all this. There's really no right or wrong answer for most of these questions. It's just going to come down to what use cases do you have and you're going to have to do your own research there. But I just don't want you to go spend $8,000 on a RED camera and have nothing for sound, nothing for lighting, nothing for editing. You need to divvy up that money more responsibly and I hope this video showed you where you can get the biggest return on those investments both now and in the future. Check out the Patreon for more weekly videos, making a lot of cool stuff there. Subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see y'all next week.